Hey, welcome back everybody to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. We're really excited because we have this amazing conversation. We have a new platform that we're filming off of. And so um, it's just a great day all around. Don't you think, Tony? I absolutely think it's a great day all the way around. I love it. Hey, Heather Hiscox. Okay, first of all, I didn't realize that you were from the same state where I live. Where Where are you? Yeah, I'm in Tucson, Arizona. Right. Oh, Pablo. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> super cool because, you know, when we talk with our guests, they're from all over the world. Very rarely are they from Arizona. So how yeah. fabulous. We have, we're going to be fast friends. Yes, definitely. Definitely. For we can commiserate sure. about the heat. <laughs> well, this is true. This, <laughs> this is definitely a truth. It really, really is. Well, hey, another thing that we never commiserate about are our amazing presenting sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These folks join us day in and day out so we can have these amazing conversations. The other really amazing thing that gets me all jazzed up and excited is this magical group of co-hosts that we have assembled. They come from throughout the country. They're very diverse. Today, we have Tony Bell, Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy. Welcome, Tony. Thank you so much, Julia. You know, I'm so honored to be part of this group of co-hosts and it's the diversity and, and you know, and thought and experience. It just adds so much to the show. Uh, so thank you for having me here to join you and uh, Heather today. You know, it's, uh, I think the um, location, the diversity of location, tell, tell us where you're coming to us from today. Today, I am coming from you uh, in Bowie, Maryland. Bowie, Maryland. Okay, we'll see. There you go. There we. So we got the West represented in the East. You, it doesn't get better than that, does it? No. Hey, um, Heather Hiscox, tell us about Pause for Change. Two words that are incredibly powerful. How did you put them together and what does this look like in your work? Yeah, Pause for Change came to be out of my own frustration of looking at how we were trying to address these large social problems within organizations and saying, okay, hold up. Part of it is we are just rushing to solutions. We're just, we're operating under such urgency along with that scarcity go, 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 solve, 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 we're rewarded for creating and moving forward. But what I noticed in my work that was most beneficial was to take those pause moments mm -hmm. to really slow down, think critically, think um, collectively, collaboratively in new ways. And that really moved all of our innovations and our impact forward. And it's the number one advice once I became a consultant that I gave to all of my clients was just hang on a minute, hold up, pause, let's really take the time to think differently. And that is really what I have seen transform to change. Heather, I, I, I love that you mentioned the scarcity mentality because that is such a barrier for success uh, and so much of, of the change that we're hoping to accomplish. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's a mode of thinking that we need to really disrupt and challenge and get to the origins of to really get to that more deep-seated change. For sure. You know, it seems like we're in the nonprofit sector. Um, we're in such crisis mode. And some of it's real. I mean, some of it's real. When we have a natural disaster, we have people that literally can suffer, uh, you know, physical harm or loss of life. Yeah, that's that's a crisis. And we got to jump in and, and think as, and, and act as fast as we can. But not the, the entire sector is not like that. And so we just you know, we're on the hamster wheel of life um, without taking this this um, structural approach. So start off with the the pause framework. What does that look like? And and, and talk talk us through that. Yes, thanks. So, you know, it's it's considered pause. It's an acronym. Each of the letters stands for a different step and skill, the framework. But the P is around packaging the challenge. I work with so many organizations that don't even have clarity on what the challenge is. 
and who's impacted, who are all the different stakeholders impacted, and how do we really get focus so we're not trying to create these one size fits all solutions. And then the A is for assessing uncertainty. How do we get more comfortable with naming and knowing what we don't know? Really calling it out to design our learning journey. And then the U is understand stakeholders. How do we co-design and really listen to those internal and external stakeholders who are most impacted and connected to our solutions? And then the S is how do we test solutions before we build them? We can build a lot of stuff because we are amazing in the sector, but should we build all of those things? Should we rush to that brainstorming mode and really move forward? How do we test those embedded assumptions that live within all of our different potential solutions? And how do we test them in hours and weeks to get definitive answers? And that's what the E is all about of pause, evidence-informed decision-making. Mm -hmm. How do we make decisions based on what we know will actually work and create impact? So it's just a whole new way of shifting. It's a whole new set of problem solving skills that can be used in any area of uncertainty to help people guide their work forward with, with confidence, with clarity, with intentionality. Um, it's just a whole new way to operate. I love a good acronym. So thank you for explaining <laughs> that. Uh, and if I could ask, how would, when you introduce this, how much unlearning do folks have to go through mm -hmm in order to embrace pause? Yeah, oh, such a great question. You know, I learned really early, I started to do a lot of guest lecturing at universities and I was asked to teach um, empathy interviewing oh. to students in, in journalism, business, law, all these different areas. And I was trying to teach them how to be more empathetic. And I realized that a lot of these students didn't have the lived experience at their younger age to really understand their intersectionalities, their positionalities, their biases. Mm -hmm. And so that was so fantastic to have that, to run into those barriers early and often to see what it would take to have people really understand that we don't have to be scared of what we don't know. We don't have to be afraid of the, the punishment or retribution around you know, not knowing certain information. We can actually celebrate it. We can say all of us are biased. All of us see the world in different ways based on our backgrounds. And that's actually our superpower. So let's just sit and collectively name what we don't know. And just incorporating that early skill into the framework, it just shifts people's mindsets where they go, oh, I can make a mistake. I can be unsure. I can, I can say it out loud. I don't have to be embarrassed or hide it. And then it's like, okay, great. Now we have a roadmap. We have a roadmap for our learning and how we're going to engage with all of our stakeholders. Let's go. So it starts to be that engine, whereas uncertainty is like troublesome and scary. It becomes the engine that drives the impact forward. Yeah. Thank you for answering that. Wow. Okay. So I feel like end of show, that was the big message for me. Like, I really need to process this because, you know, in leadership and in crisis management, we are taught kind of the opposite. And Tony used that amazing word, unlearn. Um, that's a that's a big step for somebody to, to stand up and say, I don't know, or I have a different lens that could be problematic. Um, I, I think that is riveting. I mean, this this is a. This is a new way of thinking for a lot of people and maybe even just self-identifying or recognizing this process, Heather, really, really interesting. One of the things you talked about um, is testing and looking at different solutions. We don't do this enough because generally we feel compelled to just get out there and do. So how do we navigate this? What's your advice for us on this? Yeah, you know, it's really normal and unfortunate that how we operate in the sector is we start to brainstorm. Like we notice there's a problem and we sort of panic. And that's a, that's a normal biological reaction, right? Because when we decide a path to move forward, we make a decision, our bodies actually, our brains get secreted, all that dopamine rushes through our bodies. And we say, okay, I feel better now. You know, I don't have that neck pain, my stomach ache. I just want to rush to solution. So when we when we pause, what we do is we we really, instead of just building and building, building, I have this image I use called the giant triangle of waste, where it's on a teetering, <laughs> unstable, murky idea of what the issue is. And we just keep building solution on top of it. And we get to the very top and then we do sort of a grand reveal. 
-hmm. you know, we're building in silos and disconnection. We're building just within our own organizations. We're not including all stakeholders. And then we do this reveal and say, hey, we made this for you. Whether it's an internal policy or process change or it's an external facing program. And then that is so risky because we've invested months and years in some cases, blood, sweat and tears. And then the, the stakeholder goes, well, I don't want that or that you're talking to me like I have another problem that you're not even aware of or I've already been working on a different solution, but you never included me. Mm -hmm. So I now reject and actually feel harmed by your potential solution. So what we do is we really flip that. And we say, okay, let's not brainstorm until after we have clarity and after we've talked to our stakeholders in detail and we've asked them, like, what would really delight you? What would change your entire perspective and experience and outcome? And then what we do is we take maybe 40 different ideas. So we're not operating from that scarcity. We're not like, oh, this is our make or break one thing. No turning back. Don't tell anyone if we mess up. We just have to forge ahead. Instead, we can prioritize all those different solutions and know that we have so many. It's such an abundance to fall back on because we're creative people. We do awesome work. And then we take that one solution and we try to break it. And that is so antithetical. Our solutions are taught like they're so precious. Like don't hurt them, right? They have to, they have to make it to the top, to the end. But instead we say, okay, out of this solution, what must be true for this actually to create value for our stakeholders? What are all of those assumptions? Do people have to show up? How do they invest their time, resources, and energy? Um, all the different elements that must happen in order for them to fully participate and derive impact from that solution. We test those. We prioritize like another 30 assumptions and we run these quick tests. So we say, if we make an offer, if we do something to engage our stakeholder, What's the behavior that we want to see of whether or not they can access and engage in our potential solution? And then we watch and see what happens. So we're really scientists. We're hypothesis mm -hmm. testing with great love and care. And then we're saying, wow, that stunk. Ugh. <laughs> Ditch that idea. Or we go, wow, people loved it. Let's test the next layer of assumptions. And let's really increase that confidence and clarity to keep building. I love that you talk about the testing because I I think generally speaking, as a sector, we are risk adverse. Uh, you know, we are rarely really putting ourselves out there and taking big risks. So this testing that you're speaking of, uh, I would think makes more of the stakeholders comfortable with some of those risks as we're kind of benchmarking its appropriateness, if you will, along the way. Yeah, you know, what I what I always hear that people say we're risk averse. And what I say to that is the way that we operate currently with current problem solving skills is the ultimate risk. I couldn't agree more. We're not testing. We're just coming up with our ideas by ourselves and launching them out into the world and crossing our fingers using millions of dollars, mm -hmm. right, of public and private investment sure. and hoping it works out. Oh, like, no, we don't have to wait months and years to, and run pilot studies to get results. My teams get results and they know what's going to happen within weeks. And it just transforms the process. So let's you're, talk you're about that. Just to build in applause. Yeah, <laughs> I know. You have to build in audience applause. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's right. We need to get a loop, a sound loop. Uh, we'll get Kevin, our executive producer on that. Heather, mm -hmm. this is a, a really interesting thing. And this is where we want to kind of chat with you about building that organizational buy-in because um, how do you navigate this with funders or grant makers? You, you know, how do you, I, I can understand and see this when you're looking at, at clients with clients and you're looking at your community and you can say, we want to be more impactful. We want to be more effective. So we're going to test this. But how do you have that conversation with funders? Because they guide so many of our decisions, whether or not they realize it. And so how do we have that conversation? Oh, such a great question. Yeah, philanthropy is difficult with this, I'll, I'll admit it. But I've had really great experiences playing in different sandboxes with some really um, open-minded, trust-based philanthropy groups. Um, with one foundation, I've done three separate projects. Um, we worked on an amazing project with the Girl Scouts of the USA with the entire executive team. And they were looking at a national gender parity initiative. Mm -hmm. And they had 
put in a proposal to this foundation, a very large proposal, and said, you know, here are the seven components that we want to address. Here's the measurable outcomes. Here's the timeline, all of that. And the foundation said, oh, like, that's inspiring and amazing. And we're not sure if you can do this. So they brought me in and paid for their time, paid for my time for us to test those seven key areas. And what we found is that four of them were fantastic three of them were not quite strong. They didn't actually meet the need. And one of them actually would have resulted in a pretty scary uh, PR scandal. <laughs> so we caught that very early. We were able to work with this team to interview stakeholders, to test those ideas. And then they were able to go back to that funder who was engaged the entire time and say, here's our vulnerable learning Here's the ways that we're asking different questions. We're testing these solutions that we did tell you were perfect and tied up with a bow and we'd be able to do everything. And they were able to be vulnerable, transparent to share, you know, this is what we've learned and we're going to pivot and here's why. And we're going to actually put this into fast forward because it's amazing. And so it changed the dynamic in the conversation with the funder and they actually got about 25% more in their version two of the application. And so it became like this stage gate investment sort of set up this stage gate philanthropy and this trust based relationship based experience that was fantastic. Okay, well, again, Tony, I'm like, my head's just like going. Um, well, for, for me, it's just another, you know, statement about why it's important to take donors and our investors on the journey with us. Uh, and, and not to just, you know, thank them for their gift and, and their investment and then just kind of move along with the work. I mean, the more they're side by side with us along the journey, again, the more they understand, you know, how the sausage is made, and then, you know, and, and all of that. So and I, that was a, a really great example. You know, Heather, I've got to believe, I, I think you said something that was really powerful. And and the thing that really stuck out to me was that in the end, and correct me if I'm wrong, in the end, that funder leaned in more to the investment, mm -hmm. probably because they felt that it was a stronger bet and that they could see their investment, you know, materialize in a way that was profound for their own mission, right? I mean, yeah. it, it's a fascinating thing. I mean, is that something that you're seeing that when you do, as Tony mentioned, take take these these funders on the journey with you? Is that reality? Yeah, you know, it works in multiple ways. So there's that dynamic of learn together. And then let's talk about the funding once we have the evidence to really show what's going to happen. And then the other way that it works is, you know, right now how nonprofits write their grant applications, and I've written many in my time, <laughs> is we, we write it as if we know exactly what's going to happen. We're going to serve this number of people with this amazing program and this short amount of time with these measurable objectives and we're awesome. We do no wrong. Anything that's going on behind the curtain will stay behind the curtain. <laughs> Promote this stuff, but like that's a ridiculous notion that we're going to get some of these solutions correct at, on the first try. And every time, because working with humans who are infinitely complex and moving and being shaped by their context and world around us. So that's such a ridiculous premise that the sector and philanthropy live on. I, I mean, that's one of the deepest thoughts that I really want to challenge in our work. We do not know exactly what's going to work because these issues are really difficult and super entangled with systems and structures and all the things. And so what I say to often my nonprofit clients, and even my local government clients are applying for funding as well, is to say, instead of that once upon a time story technique that you're using for your grant writing, how much more powerful would it be to say, we just talked to 50 of our key stakeholders. This was a key solution that rose to the top. These are the 10 riskiest assumptions that if these are not true, the solution will not work. And we've tested all of them. And here's the 20 points of data that show you why this will absolutely work because we've already tested it. That proposal and other foundations have told me would stand head and shoulders above any other traditional proposals because it's it's real action, it's real time, it shows that transparency and vulnerability, and it's the proof is right there. They don't have to wait a year for their reporting structure to manifest results that may or may not be 100% real with how we're trying to hide that stuff behind the curtain, but they get to see it right then. 
And I've seen this with some of my other clients. Um, they've gotten angel investments for yeah. projects. They've had large gifts from donors based on having these different types of conversations. So it's really powerful. And it's like I said, it stands out from what we traditionally do. I love it. You know, we don't have much time uh, left with you. And I was profoundly impacted by a video that I watched this morning on your website. And I'm a cheerleader for our sector. And I'm always saying, yay team, go look at this or whatever. But of maybe in this last five years, one of the top 10 things I've seen is a YouTube video on your website talking about philanthropy from a higher level. Um, talk to us about this project that you have. I, I, I have so many folks I'm going to send this around to who actually operate in the foundation space. Um, super controversial in many ways, super thoughtful, uh, very honest. Talk to us about this. I'll stop talking. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. I love you're a fan. And please share widely. Um, <laughs> in, in March of 2020, you know, when the world was really collapsing, right, with the murders of George Floyd and, and many others, um, you know, all of COVID, us not knowing what was shut down, what was happening, right? It was so nourishing to talk to other people in the sector who I really look up to, who are really reimagining what's possible. And that's really what that time was for me. I know many people just needed to like settle in, really focus, focus and arrest. But I felt like it was this giant time of expansion. And so May of 2020, my co-founder at the time, Devin Davey and I started this conversation series called Possibility Project. You can find it at possibilityproject.org. And we just started honestly bringing friends and friends of friends to have conversations around provocations that we thought were key about how to re reimagine philanthropy. How do we, um, we just had a, a episode, we're on 50th episode now, five years later, all about DEI or about, excuse me, about, um, we're talking about AI and about AI and potential harm and benefits to the sector. We've talked about so many other topics where I bring in panelists, these are two or three people, and we just get to talk about the two provocations that we discuss every single episode. And the first is always, what's a dysfunction related to this topic that you want to disappear? So that's that soapbox moment we get to talk about what is messed up, how did we get here, and it's all based on stuff we have in the sector to deal with. And then we say, what's emerging that gives us hope? What's possible? What action can we take? What can we do from the inside out to really reimagine and transform our work in the sector? And so it has been so nourishing and thought provoking and challenging to have those topics and episodes. And we've created a community now of thousands of frustrated change makers who want to ask these big, bold questions. And they want to do it in community. They want to know they're not alone that other people are asking these questions and that they can join in as well. So give us an example of what some of those questions are, Heather, because they were tremendously profound and incredibly honest. Yeah, I mean, one of, one of the ones I think in that highlight really referring to was, you know, in philanthropy, there's that whole issue of the, the ceiling versus the floor of that 5% of how founda foundations are giving those funds. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, there's not a lot of analysis of where those foundations are investing their dollars. Mm -hmm. um, Glenn Gallich talks about this from Stupsky Foundation. He talks about some of the investments that they have, that other 95% of their portfolios are invested in, um, you know, companies or markets that are creating harm. So you could really have a foundation who's all about climate action and protection investing heavily in fossil fuels at the same time, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, how do we keep peeling back those layers of power and privilege and asking those deeper questions around systems and structures of saying, who has the power to do nothing about this? Who has the power to, to embrace status quo and stay in their cozy nest? And what are all the dynamics that we can really push forward as change makers to demand a new way? And how, how do we do that collectively? That's really the things that we start to talk about. It's incredibly profound. Um, it's a tremendous different an array of voices on that sizzle reel. Um, I would imagine, and Heather, it's like what, you know, I don't, I was so engaged. It's, it's like seven minutes. Yeah. It's, it's not a typical short video. <laughs> it's a little bit long. I mean, it's, 
it's 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 short be, because it made me want to dive deeper. But mm -hmm. um, different voices making incredibly um, in, intelligent observations about our sector and the mm -hmm. things that we um, we we get frustrated by, but we don't address. Right? Uh, it, it's fascinating, and this information is packaged in a podcast format. Yes, there's two ways to engage in it. So there's the YouTube channel so people can subscribe and you know get those alerts and watch it on YouTube if you want to see the video interactions of, of the guests and all of that, which is fun. And then it's also I'm converting all of the episodes from 2022 forward into podcasts and those will be out actually in a couple of weeks. Um, so there's a couple of ways that, that folks can engage and they can join the LinkedIn group. Once they register for any episode, they'll get alerted for any future invites. So they, it's really an online talk show format. Yeah. So people can join via Zoom and participate in the chat. They can ask Q&A. We do two sets of interactive breakout rooms where people actually get to meet other people in that network. Nice. And there's just been amazing collaborations and friendships that have grown out of those speaker connections, the attendee connections. And it's, it's kind of grown beyond what I ever imagined. Some organizations watch recordings together as a team and have thoughtful wow. conversations. Yeah. Uh, some people featured at conferences. Um, they just do the work of reflection, again, with pausing that we all need to do as participants in this system. We participate in the sector in so many ways, and we are responsible for acknowledging and interrogating some of our own practices. Um, so it just, I create the container and I just bring amazing folks to play once a month. <laughs> I well, love it. And congratulations for creating such a safe space for these conversations. I mean, it, it has to be a place where people feel comfortable and safe uh, in order to really open up and, and speak the truth. So congratulations on that, Heather. Thank you. Yeah, people join on every element of the knowledge spectrum. Some people, like the AI episode, could be a panelist, right? They have been working in AI for years and they are really fluent in all of the benefits and harms. And there are some people that join who are very new to these topics mm -hmm. and there's a place for everyone. There's no judgment of how we enter this space. Um, our speakers, the number one feedback is that it's fun and that mm -hmm. they, they do feel safe. They do feel like they can just be themselves and speak the truth mm -hmm. about what they're experiencing, what they're seeing. And so we do try to create that network uh, of safety and appreciation for learning because we're all trying to do better. Absolutely. Bravo. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I think uh, that's the, the correct spirit um, of starting a conversation. I know that that's, you know, one of our core values with, you know, the nonprofit show is absolutely speak your truth and, and how do we learn and how do we improve? Because when we improve and we learn, we all benefit, right? I mean, everybody from, from top to bottom. So yeah, Heather nice. Hiscox, founder and CEO, Pause for Change. Check out pauseforchange.com and you'll get to learn more about Heather and her work and really just get some fabulous insights on a new way of doing things, but yet it's it's really maybe more of a smarter way, if you will. Um, and of course, now that I know you're an Arizona girl, I even love your program even more <laughs> because I didn't know that when we started out. So um, that's really a cool thing. Heather Hiscox, again, founder and CEO of Pause for Change. What an amazing uh, conversation we've had today, and I've really, really enjoyed it. Another thing that's super powerful in our orbit are our presenting sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that join us day in and day out, so we can have these amazing conversations like we've had with Heather and Tony today. Okay, Tony, I don't know about you, but I'm all revved up and ready to really look at my day differently. Me too. Let's do it. All right. Hey, Heather, thank you so much. And and thank I will you. share with you, um, this has really been a profound, um, I don't know, illumination for me today, watching that video. I just, I loved so many things. I was challenged. I was frightened. I disagreed. I agreed. Um, I really encourage everybody to watch that sizzle reel because it's it's really an amazing way to to think about our world in the nonprofit sector and the things that we work so hard for. 
Another thing that we do every day at the end of each episode is that we end with this mantra and it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. Thanks everybody. We'll see you back here for another episode of The Nonprofit.